I'm talking about idle and agile, um, just a little bit about myself and my background in these two areas. In addition to working with customers and deploying IT service management solutions over the last few decades, um, I also have my idle expert designation as well, well as uh, my agile scrum master certification. So I have a little bit of experience in the theory behind Idle and Agile, and wanted to share some of my ideas with you all this afternoon, and specifically how we can use the two frameworks together as opposed to seeing them as competing frameworks, and how we can then improve the incident management and the services that we provide to our customers. So we'll start first looking at Agile. Um, we'll look at some of the basic concepts around Agile, and then we'll move into the idle processes, and specifically we'll talk about incident management, um, some of the key components there of incident management, and how we can you use idle um, and Agile guidelines or the frameworks in order to make improvements to the incident management service that we provide to our customers. So when we talk about Agile, um, unlike Idle, the Agile, uh, this whole concept around Agile and the, the theory behind it is very streamlined. So it, it, it's very telling. And when you look at the Idle framework, it consists of five large volumes and lots of complementary guidance, whereas with the um, Agile Manifesto and Agile Principles, they, all of that information fits on two slides of this PowerPoint presentation. The Manifesto talks about software, and you can see here it's talking about working software is more useful and welcome than just presenting documents to clients and meetings. So the idea is that you um, are able to very quickly present your customer with actual software that they can use. And I apply this in a similar way to processes. So working processes, um, I guess it would be, are more useful and welcome than just presenting documents to clients and meetings. So with the Agile methodology and specifically the Agile hybrid approach that we take to a lot of our projects, instead of gathering a lot of requirements up at the beginning and trying to deploy a large application to our customers, we often try to break it down into individual modules or workspaces and thereby realize value very quickly and um, we're able to review the systems um, and the processes with our customers very quickly so that they can adopt them and provide quick wins to their organizations. You'll notice here, too, this fourth bullet. And when I talked last week about how you can streamline change management using Agile and Idle, um, Agile is all, all about responding quickly to change. And I would argue that that applies for incident management as well. So certainly being on the front lines, working on a service desk, you're in a very fast-paced environment. And being able to adapt to new software that's being rolled out uh, to the new devices that show up within the infrastructure, especially with, when customers are bringing their own devices into the, work, the workplace. Um, having that agility, I would say, for incident management is just as critical. Some of the principles around Agile, again, substituting here processes for the word software, um, you can see that when you're rolling out a new process to an organization, so if you're on the side of in IT where you're actually trying to implement some good practices around incident management, it's important if you can find some basic components up front that can, um, that can really help to maximize the value to the organization and um, something that you can build on then for further improvements. And we'll talk a lot about continual service improvement and how that applies to both in the, both the agile and idle worlds. 
also something to point out item number 10 here, looking at simplicity. So I would say that for incident management, simplicity is also very important. There's always a balance or this balancing act, act that we have to do when we're trying to implement new processes. And I think that sometimes management would prefer more detailed processes so that they have better control and they have better reporting. Whereas the staff members within IT are always looking for ease of use and a process that's not too cumbersome. In this way, and especially when we're looking at agile principles, I, we would side with the, the staff members and really look at how can we simplify and, and lead these processes to be something that's going to be very easy to adopt and um, practices that will show their value so that people will want to adopt those practices within the organization. Now, Within Agile, I mentioned the the, uh, the manifesto and the principles fit fit on two slides there with the two, the two slides with all of the details about Agile. So to provide some additional guidance, there are a number of methods that have been developed around these the Agile concept. Um, some of the, some of these should look familiar to you, and I will touch on two of them. Um, as I mentioned, I did go through the certification training to become a Scrum Master. Um, also within Right Star, we work with Jira products um, and the, in the Atlassian product line. And uh, Jira has a Kanban component, so I will show that as well. But understand that there are a number of different ways or different methods that you can use to employ Agile, um, the Agile framework in your organization. So let's look first at Scrum. So in the Scrum life cycle, there is some upfront discovery. However, the process itself is iterative, meaning that you have work that's broken down into chunks or what we call sprints, typically scheduled within a two week time frame. So as you are looking to implement processes or update processes within your environment, so again, this would apply the same way to um, rolling out software as it would to rolling out processes. You want to capture the requirements or the what we call user stories on an ongoing basis. Prioritize those so you can um, enact or deploy the highest value processes first or procedures first, and then have a mechanism whereby you can roll out these procedures on a two week, every two week basis. So again, by doing this type of rollout as opposed to a waterfall where you have a single requirements gathering phase and then months later you come out with an end product that either doesn't match the original requirements or you come out with this end product and find that the requirements have changed. By doing this in shorter sprints, it allows you to be more adaptive to the changing requirements and also to provide more feedback or get more feedback from your end users and customers. I mentioned I'd also show the Kanban. This is an example of a Kanban board. Originally, when this was developed, it was, the Kanbans were actual boards up on the wall. Um, sometimes this is done with sticky notes, but this can also be done electronically. So you can see here that I can see at a glance where my project is. Um, for example, I see that there are a number of items in progress. I can see if there are any bottlenecks in my overall project or in the workflow. And this allows me to then add new requirements or new to-dos on the front end and have them processed then um, through, the, uh, through the work in progress. So to talk a little bit more about work in progress. Work in progress, some often abbreviated as WIP, is the flow of work. 
So through the workflow, you want to have as much automation as possible, and that would apply again for incident processes as well. And you also are aiming for continuous integration and deployment. So it's not, again, the, the big waterfall type of project where you feel that you've got to sit down and really iron out all your procedures for incident management. There are certain things that you can do. You can kind of um, take this small bites at a time and really start to show the value of incident processes um, and good incident processes within your environment. So let's talk about incident management itself as um, a process within IDLE. The definition here is that it's the, uh, the focus of incident management is to restore normal service to customers as quickly as possible. For incident management, the service desk is the owner of the process typically. So you ha usually have a service desk manager who serves as the incident process owner. The function of the service desk is to serve as a single point of contact. So they are the front lines of IT within the business or within the organization. They often are the advocates for the business or for those customers because they see what the customers deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. The hope is that having a service desk to provide that front end to the customers will also allow the organization to leverage more expensive assets for um, proactive delivery activities, meaning that the, the service desk is typically an, an entry-level position for IT. Um, and I think that for this reason, it's important to understand not just incident management, but how it all relates to some of the other processes. So, Whereas Agile is streamlined, um, a little bit easier to understand, can be quickly encapsulated in a few slides. The IDLE framework is, as I mentioned, broken down into five separate volumes that are represented by the five phases here of the service life cycle. And within those phases, there are 26 separate processes. Additional processes and, and concepts have been added over the years. So version three of IDLE was released in 2007, and there have been a few updates along the way. But a lot of these core processes have remained the same over the years. And when we're talking about incident management, these processes that I've highlighted here are complementary processes to incident management. And I would point out, um, especially knowledge management, when you talk about good practices for incident management, um, it's important to have a knowledge base so that you can push as much, as much of the information down to the level one service desk as possible. It's also important to have a good configuration management system. So providing asset and configuration item data, again, down to the lowest level as possible so that if a service desk analyst is trying to resolve an issue on the phone, that they can quickly and easily see what equipment it is that the, um, the caller is working with. So they can hopefully easily determine whether they're assigned a laptop or a desktop and what applications perhaps they may be using. You could probably argue that all of these individual processes are related to incident management in some way or another, but I highlighted these as the most critical. Um, demand management, identifying what are going to be the busiest times um, so that you can have appropriate staffing on the service desk. Uh, having a well-identified service catalog so that the service desk knows what it is that they're supporting. Um, having appropriate service levels for the service desk so they know they have an agreement with the customers on things like what is our mean time to restore service, what's our average speed to answer on the phones, and that they can then, with that knowledge and expectation, can provide services appropriately and have um, be on good terms with their customers. 
the service desk is also the front line of information security. So they're dealing with access requests and password management. And as we'll see when we look at the incident model, there are inputs from other processes into incident management, such as event management. So events within the infrastructure can trigger incidents. And there are also outputs. So from incident management, um, there may be the need to hand off to service request management or problem management. So let's take a look in a little bit more detail at the incident management process and specifically the incident model. So I mentioned that there are inputs from a number of different sources, including event management. Regardless how you structure your service desk, though, all incidents seem to follow this very basic model or process. So we have um, the in initial incident identification. And I would say that one thing that, that often trips us up is this first decision. Is the service broken or degraded? If not, then we're actually dealing with something different than incident management where we may want to be able to, or hopefully can, hand off to the request fulfillment process. That streamlines things for us and really makes our reporting much more even. It helps us to be better identify how we're doing with true break-fix type of issues. If we determine there is an issue, we log the incident, categorize the incident, Associate, associate the appropriate level of priority. At this point, we may determine or may need to determine whether this is a major incident or not. And you may want to have a separate handling process for major incidents. Um, alternately, you could hand this off to the problem management process. So there are times when a simple break fix issue has a more serious underlying root cause and that's when a problem investigation would need to be launched. But in the case of that it's not a major incident, it, we go through an initial diagnosis, we determine whether an escalation is needed. Is this a functional escalation, meaning that the person doesn't have the capabilities or permissions to resolve a particular issue? Or is there a hierarchical escalation needed? So perhaps this is um, a VIP calling or there's some other conflict that needs to be handled by a manager, then it goes on to hierarchical escalation. Regardless, though, the next step will always be the investigation and diagnosis. And this is where I would say that we would um, be helped by input from the knowledge management process, whether it be a list of known errors or some basic how-tos that we can step through with the customer. And again, as much as we can push down to the even below level one, um, if we're looking at web-based self-service, if we want to look at streamlining things, putting knowledge out on a self-service interface really um, prevents that incident from being logged. Um, so it, it stops the incident before it even gets logged into the system. Ultimately, though, we are working towards resolution, recovery of the service, and finally, incident closure. So there are a lot of inputs and outputs from other, ser other services to other services and processes. And one of the important things here to remember is that we need to have good communication. And good communication can be facilitated using some um, different tools. But one tool in particular that I like is the RACI matrix. It helps us to see um, and determine clear pathways of, so for example, if you're looking at the incident management process and the activities associated with it, there needs to be um, certain people who are responsible, certain people will be accountable, Others may need to be consulted, and some may need to be informed. So in the, in the case of the incident management process, the service desk manager is ultimately accountable for that process. 
There may be service desk analysts and even level two or level three technicians who need to also be responsible for providing resolution for incidents. You may need to consult with the business or with third-party vendors. And um, there is a certain flow of information, whether it be back to the end users or there should be um, information going from level two de back down to the service desk. So the incident comes in, goes to the service desk, gets escalated, maybe goes off to a vendor. There may need to be um, new equipment purchased. It's very easy for um, information or communication to be missed at one step along the way. So what we encourage our customers to do, again, going back to some of our agile principles, is, is simplifying this as much as possible and automating this as much as possible. There are a number of different forms of communication. I would say standard operating procedures around incident management are critical um, in some type of document share that should be easily accessible to the team. We can also provide um, information to our customers via email, and again, looking at automation as much as possible. So you can have different types of notifications during the incident management process. And really, when I, um, when I teach some of these processes to my customers, um, the two things that I want them to understand is the importance of communication and the other is um, getting some of this basic terminology down. So understanding the, uh, you know, what does it mean when we talk about incidents versus problems versus events and so on. Going back for a moment um, to look at the supporting processes that I mentioned in the earlier slide. Um, so I mentioned that it's important to understand some of the connections, some of the inputs from the other processes. So we talked about event management being an input into incident management, knowledge management being an input. And then there may be some outputs. So there might be um, incidents might feed into service requests or problems. Or they may get be handed off to access management. In working with our processes, um, again, sticking with some of the idle concepts at this point, um, uh, most of these pro supporting processes are part of the service operation phase of the life cycle because incident management occurs in the service operation phase. Handing off or having an output from um, the operations phase is uh, the, the output that we get from that phase is reporting. And reporting will help us, again, with this iterative cycle um, to really make some good improvements through this whole continual service improvement phase of the life cycle. So another commonality or common feature between Agile and Idle is they both rely on this concept of continual improvement. Um, it, this is kind of the basis of these concept is what we call the Deming cycle. It was developed by a gentleman named Deming and consists of just four parts, plan, do, check, act. So this is common to the scrum cycle that I showed you, and it's common to the continual service improvement model that's part of the idle framework. So we start with, um, where are we now? Where do we want to be? How do we get there? Did we get there? And keeping the momentum going, just keeping, again, if you overlap that with the, um, the Agile or Scrum cycle, we start each sprint with, okay, what, is, what are the requirements? Where are we now? How do we incorporate those requirements into our latest release, whether it be a, a process or software? We do a review at the end and then a retrospective before starting all over again. To help us with a measurement to see 
to see our progress, see how much improvement we're making, it's important to understand for the service desk and, um, and its process incident management, there are a number of different critical success factors that we could define. And that's really a, an important part of measuring, again, both for idle and for agile. Um, there may be, may be a number of key performance indicators that we can identify. So if the organization determines that the ability to handle increasing call volume is a critical success factor, then there are a number of indicators that will help us to identify whether we're actually meeting that goal. So to wrap up for this afternoon, some of the key points that I hope I've been able to communicate here. Um, it's not agile versus idle. When we're looking at implementing new processes within our organizations, uh, we can pull from both methodologies to make improvements. And using agile, we want to make sure that we are identifying some quick wins, implementing in short iterative sprints, and really showing the organization that we can both simplify while at the same time improve the processes and improve the service that we're providing to our customers. If you do have any other questions about the information that we've provided here today, um, we do have a question and answer panel and you can also contact us directly. I'm going to take a look and see um, I don't know that any questions have come in. At this point, I want to thank you all for joining us this afternoon and hope that you can make it to our next e-class. Um, it's been my pleasure. Have a great rest of the day. <laughs>